with the Marines Memorial Association. My name is Peter Robertson. I'm chairman of the board of the trustees of the World Affairs Council, and I'll be your moderator for this evening. Before we begin, let me give you a quick word on the two organizations hosting the event. The Marines Memorial Association is a non The mic's not on. I just need to be really close to it. The Marines Memorial Association is a nonprofit veterans organization chartered to honor the valor and memory of members of the United States Armed Forces who were lost or killed in service for their country. To learn more about the organization, visit its website at, marine, at marineclub.org, or excuse me, .com. The World Affairs Council offers a neutral forum on critical international issues and opportunities. To learn more about the Council, hear its programs, or join its membership, please visit our website at worldaffairs.org. This program will be recorded for radio, and a special thanks goes to our audio engineer, Ms. Jane Heaven. Now please take this moment to turn off all cell phones and other noise-making devices. We will take questions from the audience in the second part of the program, so please make use of the blue question cards on your seats. Council members will collect them during the program. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's event is a precursor to a more in-depth conversation that will be held during our annual conference, World Affairs 2013, Transition, Disruption, and Innovation. On Thursday, March the 7th, and Friday, March the 8th, the Council will host this conference at the St. Regis Hotel in San Francisco. One of the keynote sessions will feature experts Laura Tyson and Gillian Tett, speaking about the U.S. and global economies. Registration is now open, so please visit our website to secure your place. It's now my distinct honor to introduce this evening's distinguished guest. Robert B. Reich is the Chancellor's Professor of Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley and was Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. Time Magazine named him one of the 10 most effective cabinet secretaries of the last century. Professor Reich has thir written 13 books, including the bestsellers Aftershock and The Work of Nations. His latest, Beyond Outrage, is now out in paperback. He is also a founding editor of the American Prospect Magazine and he is chairman of Common Cause. He is here to discuss economy, inequality, and Obama's second term. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Reich. Thank you. And thank you, Peter, and thank you also, World Affairs Council of Northern California, and thank all of you uh, for coming here tonight. Uh, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, I thought tonight would be appropriate, given last night's State of the Union address, uh, for me to talk about the State of the Union. Uh, how many of you, out of curiosity, saw that address last night? Did anybody not see the address last night? What were you doing with yourself last night? Uh, 33 million Americans uh, watched uh, an extraordinary, uh, and that State of the Union has become a kind of extraordinary, uh, almost uh, a town meeting of the nation. Uh, I had the privilege of sitting in the well of the House of Representatives watching, uh, or actually witnessing, five State of the Unions. And uh, I can tell you uh, that they are uh, as thrilling, if not more thrilling, to be at, the, but they're very hard on the knees. Uh, because uh, particularly if your president or a president from your party uh, is addressing the uh, assembled throng, uh, there are many applause lines. Bill Clinton used to write his speeches in such a way that there was an applause line every 15 seconds. And of course, you had to stand up <laughs> and then sit down and then stand up again and then sit down. And I, by the end of the, I never had a knee problem until I was Secretary of Labor. <laughs> 
Last night, one of the uh, themes that the president talked about was uh, something that I have uh, a lot of sympathy for and I want to talk to you about, and that is that the central challenge of the economy these days, and he didn't put it quite in these terms, but I'll put it in my terms, the central challenge of the economy now is not the budget deficit. That is a challenge. It's a long-term challenge, and I will address that. But the central challenge right now is jobs and wages. And to some extent, there's a tension between dealing with the long-term budget deficit and dealing with jobs and wages. And that tension is exemplified by the fight over the fiscal cliff we had coming into the year and we now are about to have once again, and also is exemplified to some extent by other showdowns that we are likely to have over, for example, lifting the debt ceiling and continuing resolutions to keep the government going. Uh, the tension, plainly put, is simply this, that if we do too much deficit reduction too quickly, we rob the economy of the demand it needs to keep going at or near full employment. In 2008, for those of you who remember, there was a major fall off in consumer demand. Why? Because we had a huge bursting of a housing bubble and people found themselves much poorer than they thought they were. Many people, because they felt poorer, they stopped buying. Businesses are not going to create jobs. In fact, businesses aren't going to even keep people employed if there are not adequate numbers of uh, customers. This is not rocket science. This is just intuitively obvious. And so you can get very easily into a downward vicious cycle in which there are fewer and fewer customers because there are fewer and fewer jobs, and that means people have less and less money in their pockets. That means fewer and fewer customers. Now, what is it that government does in those situations? Well, what we learned, and we had a painful lesson in the Great Depression, is that when there is not adequate consumer demand, and consumers and consumer spending constitutes roughly 70% of economic activity in this country. Well, when there's not enough consumer demand, when consumers are worried, when they are losing their jobs, when they have lost a big chunk of their assets, when they are not ready or willing or able to go into the shops and stores and buy all sorts of things, then government has got to stand ready to be the customer or consumer of last resort. And again, this is not a new doctrine, but it's newly applied because between the late 70s and 2008, the major problem we were concerned about in the economy was inflation. It wasn't recession. The major continuing problem or the background problem was that things would get out of control, that there would be wage and price inflation, that prices would start rising too quickly. But beginning in 2008, something else happened. We began a different era, an era much more closely aligned with an era that began in the early 30s. In fact, one might say 1929. An era in which the ongoing economic problem wasn't inflation, it wasn't too much demand, the ongoing economic problem was the potential for recession or depression, too little aggregate demand. Now, some of you are looking at me and thinking to yourself, I wonder if Reich is going to talk about where we're going. I mean, people want economic forecasting. They want to know where the economy is going. I, I want to assure you that I am not an economic forecaster. Economic forecasters exist to make astrologers look good. Uh, I came to California not that many years ago and bought uh, my first house uh, in Berkeley in April of 2006. Now, 
that should tell you something about my <laughs> economic acumen, because it turns out that April 2006 was the point, the actual month at which the housing market in Berkeley, and I assume the entire Bay Area, reached its absolute zenith. My personal financial philosophy is buy high, sell low. <laughs> so you're, you're not going to learn anything tonight of any value to you in terms of your personal investment strategy. But I hope you do walk away tonight with a deeper insight into the central problem of the economy right now. Because that problem of inadequate demand is still with us. The economy is now growing at about 2% per year. This growth of 2% per year is about the growth we've had on average since the recovery started, since the absolute bottom of the recession, the Great Recession as it's come to be known. But this 2% per year average over the last three and a half, four years is pitiful. This is about half of the average economic growth per year in the typical recovery over the last 10 recoveries. And the old economic law was the deeper the downturn, the deeper you go, the faster the bounce back. In 1933, in the Great Depression, we reached the bottommost point, and in 1934, the economy grew by around 8%. In 1935, it grew about 8.2%. In 1936, it grew something in the order of 10 or 12%. In 1937, it started to actually fall into recession again, but that had to do with government policy. And it's the same danger we face today. If we start obsessing too quickly about the budget deficit, and if we cut government spending and raise taxes on the middle class, which is what's happening right now, believe me, this is what we are doing right now. We are starting to cut government spending, and we're raising taxes on the middle class. What that is going to do is exacerbate the problem of demand. In the last quarter of 2012, the economy actually contracted. The United States economy contracted. Why did it contract? Well, consumers are still worried, they're still upset, unemployment is still 7.8%, and that doesn't even include all of the Americans who are too discouraged even to look for work, and it doesn't even include the millions of Americans who are working part-time who'd rather be working full-time. And so if government in the last quarter of last year is cutting and the much, many, many of the cuts, in fact, there was a 22% decline in spending on the military, on national defense, in the last quarter of last year. If we are pulling in our public spending at the same time that consumers are still wary, there is not going to be adequate demand for all the goods and services we could produce, which means unemployment is going to stay high, which means we are in a very fragile recovery, a fragile recovery. This continues to be one of the most fragile and anemic recoveries on record. We do need to deal with the budget deficit over the long term, but that budget deficit over the long term is being fueled or will be fueled primarily by two things. One, rising health care costs and two, baby boomers who are aging, 76 million of us. I'm a baby boomer, I was born in 1946. Bill Clinton was born in 1946. George W. Bush was born in 1946. Anybody who was anybody was born <laughs> in 1946. Share, share. Can you believe it, share. Every time I get a little bit discouraged, I think of share. <laughs> Now, why were we all born in 1946? We were born in 1946 because, well, in my case, my father was in the Second World War, and he came home. <laughs> and there was my mother. <laughs> Demographics is not complicated. 
And you had, beginning in 1946, this huge baby boom. And it extended to 1964. And the baby boomers are now facing retirement. And that is putting a strain on Medicare. It's putting a strain on Social Security. It's putting a strain on all of our systems. Now they, that is the boomers, we I should say, have been contributing into Social Security for years. And those surpluses in the Social Security Trust Fund have been used by government, because we have a unified budget, to paper over the fact that we have had a large deficit for many years. But my point is that the future, the big, big deficit of the future, have to do with health care costs and boomers. And boomers needing more and more health care. Health care is already about 18% of the entire gross domestic product of the United States. 18%. And if we don't actually figure out some way of controlling this, it's going to be up to 25% by the time the boomers have all retired. Much of the puzzle for what to do about health care, and tonight we're not really, and we don't have time to talk about health care, but it has to do with prevention, figuring out ways of preventing ill health, preventing diabetes, providing, preventing some forms of cancer, and we know how to prevent them, preventing heart disease, and we know how to do this. It has to do with prevention. My father began walking three miles a day when he turned 80. Next week he's going to be 99 and we have no idea where he is. <laughs> no, that's not true. We know exactly where he is, and I'm going down. Uh, in fact, we're all going to go down and, and celebrate uh, his birthday this weekend. But you get my drift. Long-term budget deficit is not with us right now. Right now, jobs, wages, that's the issue. Inadequate aggregate demand. It's a sequencing issue. Now, the American public is capable of walking and chewing gum at the same time. We are capable of understanding that right now we need more, and I'm going to use a word that has become a dread, bad word, stimulus. Right now we need more government spending, especially on public investments like infrastructure, roads, bridges, public transportation, Education, early childhood education, as the president said last night, basic research and development. These investments actually improve our productivity. They're not just job-creating investments. They also generate an extra bonus of greater productivity later on, faster economic growth. Bear in mind, whenever you hear people talk about the budget deficit, it only has meaning in terms of its relationship to the size of the overall economy. These numbers have no meaning other than as a ratio of the deficit or the cumulative debt to the national economy. The faster the economy grows, the better that ratio becomes. If we find ourselves in an economy that is prone to recession, or is anemic, or is contracting, as it did in the last quarter of last year, our ratio in terms of deficit to the economy or debt to the economy gets worse, not better. That's the austerity trap that Europe is now finding itself in. Now, if you follow my logic, you might be asking yourself, and should be asking yourself, one very important question. And it's one that Keynesians, such as I've given an argument exemplifying so far, don't quite answer. That is, when does government stop? When do you reach a point where there is adequate priming of the pump, to use the metaphor that John Maynard Keynes used. When and how much money has to be spent to get the economy going again? Particularly if there's not enough water in the well to begin with. The reason that American consumers 
stopped buying or fell off the cliff in 2008 was not just that the home prices that they had relied on as their nest eggs dropped in value. The more significant connection between the housing bubble bursting and American consumers getting scared or unable to keep on buying was that they could no longer use their homes as piggy banks. They could no longer use rising home values as a means of getting refinancing or getting home equity loans. Now, this is a very important point because you've got to understand something. Between the late 70s and 2008, the median wage in the United States adjusted for inflation barely rose at all. I'm going to say this again because I'm reading your faces and some of you blanked out as I said that. I think, I think it was median wage, median. You know, when, whenever you hear somebody talk about averages, you know, the average wage is going up, uh, average incomes are going up, and they are. Average wages and average incomes are going up. Uh, watch your wallet. <laughs> the basketball player Shaquille O'Neal and I have an average height of six foot one. <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? Averages cannot be trusted because, because the people at the top bring the average up. What you really want to look at is median. Median. The part, the, 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 in this case, the median wage is the wage halfway. An equal number of people are above, equal number of people below. So over the last three or more decades, particularly between the late 70s and 2008, the median wage adjusted for inflation barely increased at all. And yet the United States economy doubled in size. Therein lies, I think, a key to the problem. And it's something that even Keynesians, those who believe, as I do, that government has got to step up the plate and be the customer or consumer of last resort when regular consumers can't do it, even Keynesians are not adequately focusing on. What did Americans do when wages started flattening in the late 70s? Up to that point, in the, you know, from the end of the Second World War right into the late 70s, productivity improved and wages improved in tandem with productivity. The median wage went right up. Everybody shared in the spectacular growth of the economy. But beginning in the late 70s, when wages began to flatten, for reasons that, if there's time, I will get to. Americans continued to spend, but they could only spend by engaging in several coping mechanisms that are now exhausted. Coping mechanism number one, women into paid work. Now, bear with me on this one, because poor women had been in paid work right along, and women had been working right along. But women in the late 70s and 80s and increasingly the 90s, uh, wives and mothers, women went into paid work in extraordinary numbers, a great wave. Uh, uh, we had never seen anything like it in this country. And I wish I could tell you it was because of all the wondrous, wonderful professional opportunities open to women, but it was not primarily because of professional opportunities open to women. Women streamed in the workforce mainly to prop up family incomes that were being jeopardized because male wages were stagnating or declining. And coping mechanism then, number two. When that first one was exhausted, there's a limit to how many wives and mothers can go into paid work. When that coping mechanism was exhausted, the second one was everybody working longer hours. By the 1990s, when I was labor secretary, I was amazed when I looked at the data. The number of hours the typical 
family was putting in, 300 hours more than the typical Japanese or, or European. I mean, we were working ourselves to the bone. It wasn't just hourly workers and wage workers, it was also professionals, billable hours, women and men. I, didn't, I, I came up with an acronym describing these families, the women and men, both of whom were working long hours, barely saw each other, I called them DINs, double income, no sex. <laughs> and then when that was exhausted, we moved to the final coping mechanism, and that was using homes as piggy banks, getting all of this money out of your home. And then the housing bubble burst, and that was the end of that. You see what I'm getting at? We have a deeper structural problem right now. That deeper structural problem is not just government is not capable or is spending enough to make up for consumers' unwillingness or inability to spend. The deeper structural problem is that wages are going nowhere. In fact, the median wage today is 8% below adjusted for inflation what it was in 2000. Most of the new jobs created since the bottom of the recession pay less than the jobs that were lost in the recession. Now how can it be that over the last 33, 34 years the median wage has gone nowhere and the economy is twice as large? Where did all the money go? I'll let you ponder that one. But just to wrap up, particularly to answer the question that I asked you a moment ago, why in the late 70s did wages flatten? Well, the answer has to do with two things. One is a word that has gone from obscurity to meaninglessness without any intervening period of coherence. And that word is globalization. And the second is technological change. By the late 70s, we were immersed, as we had never been, at least not in the modern era, in globalized commerce, technologies, cargo ships, container ships, eventually satellite communication technologies, eventually the internet, all integrated the global economy so tightly that everything could be made everywhere. And new technologies of production came along that broke up the old oligopolies. Up, oh, I can see your eyes glazing over. You see, I've been teaching for so long that when I say something that causes eyes to glaze over, I know it. An oligopoly, when I say oligopolies, I simply mean uh, three or four or five major producers uh, that were very large, that, that actually got most of their profits out of economies of scale because they could produce so much of the same thing and there were only room for three or four or five in most industries, like the big three. But technologies came along, along with globalization, busted up many of those oligopolies, created much more consumer choice, that's good, but at the same time put downward pressure on wages. Huge downward pressure on wages, especially of the non-college educated in this country. And that has a structural problem that we have not yet figured out how to deal with. And until we do, until we confront the paradox of widening inequality, we are not going to have a healthy and buoyant and large and growing middle class, and we are not going to have a healthy, strong and buoyant economy. On that upbeat note, <laughs> I have so much more to talk about, but I don't, I want to hear your questions. And so I am going to end my formal presentation on that note, and again, thank you so very much for coming out tonight. Now, Peter tells me that he, is, he has already got a lot of your questions, but has warned me that he may insert a question or two of his own and will not tell me if it comes from you or from him. 
Well, I got 40 from them. So I think there's plenty of questions. Uh, the first question uh, is, goes back to your days as Secretary of Labor. Uh, it says, do you and Clinton accept any blame for the housing bubble and the crisis? Well, I accept no blame at all. <laughs> uh, it's easy uh, to blame, uh, but let me perhaps uh, underscore what I just said. I, I think that the housing bubble and the crisis uh, really comes as a final symptom of widening inequality. Uh, perhaps a, a, another way of, of driving home the same point is that if you look back over the past hundred years, there were two peak years in which the top 1%, the richest 1% took home more than 23.5% of total income in this country. The two peak years for that to occur were 1928 and 2007. Does that suggest anything to you? So uh, I'm sure that, that Bill Clinton and the Clinton administration could have done things differently. I'm sure I, I even in my humble, lowly post as Secretary of Labor could have done something uh, to perhaps avoid the housing bubble, but when you have that much inequality, when the middle class is struggling to borrow and can borrow and will borrow and utilize whatever asset it can possibly find to borrow in order to maintain its standard of living, you're setting yourself up. A lot of questions about the, the frustration of actually getting something done in Washington. So you, you mentioned the vicious cycle, uh, you, you know, if we, if we cut, uh, if we, you know, we cut costs, then we reduce jobs, less demand, so on and so forth. On the other hand, if we, if we invest, we create more debt. So obviously somebody's got to meet in the middle. So first question, a couple of questions along that line. What do you think Obama will realistically be able to accomplish in his second term? And the other one, does the, how does the Obama administration or any other Democrat get the Republican leadership to budge on economic matters? But basically, how do you get stuff done in this environment? Because uh, neither extreme is right. Uh, it is extraordinarily, extraordinarily frustrating. Uh, politics comes from the Greek root poly, meaning many, and ticks, small blood-sucking insects. <laughs> I, I don't really mean that. But that's certainly how it feels sometimes. Uh, it's not just a Washington that's divided. Uh, this country is bitterly divided, yeah. uh, and I think more divided uh, than I remember. And part of the division is that we don't any longer talk to each other. That is across the divide of ideology or party politics. It is so much easier today to live in places where the only people you come across are people who agree with you. It is so easy in this age of internet algorithms to read only things that confirm your point of view. Uh, it is so easy now to tune in to a television channel in this age of almost infinite cable television, yell radio, and tune in and hear people and see people that say things that you want them to say, and thereby not tune in to anybody you disagree with. You see, the problem is very deep here. Uh, I used to live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I came across the country and now live in Berkeley, California, and I, in, a, in a sense I now span the entire country. <laughs> every ideology, every viewpoint. But of course I'm being tongue-in-cheek. I mean, there's no difference between Cambridge, Massachusetts and Berkeley, California. They might as well be next to each other. Uh, I, I drove my Mini Cooper across the country uh, when I came from Cambridge to Berkeley. And let me tell you, there are no Mini Coopers in Oklahoma. I was standing, I, I was in line, in a gas line, uh, in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, as a matter of fact, trying to get gas to my, for my Mini Cooper, and I, there were three cars ahead of me, and some truckers, big truckers, came up, and they had not seen a Mini Cooper before, and they, 
they tapped on the window and I let it down and they, I said yes and they said, this is the smallest car we've ever seen. <laughs> How does anybody fit in here? And I, I said, very easy. And I opened the door and stepped out and I... <laughs> and they looked at me and I said, uh, I'm from the East Coast. Everybody is my size. <laughs> but we are not talking. We are not talking. Uh, you know, I write and I speak, and, and there, uh, it is extremely difficult for me to reach somebody who fundamentally disagrees. Uh, but I tell my students at Berkeley something that I deeply believe, and that is the only way you learn anything in this life is to sit down and talk with somebody who disagrees with you. Oh, a lot, a lot of concerns about money and government. Uh, this one says, what can be done about Citizens United? And what do you think about President Obama's new PAC? And the last one is, can we get rid of the notion that corporations are people? Well, I... I I'll believe that corporations are people when Texas and Alabama execute a corporation. <laughs> uh, corporations are not people. Uh, and I think that that, that uh, Citizens United decision uh, is right up there with Gore against Bush and Dred Scott and a few others that are remarkable for their lack of intelligence and logic. Now, it is possible that President Obama will have a chance to nominate a fifth Supreme Court justice, at least a fifth Supreme Court justice that is likely to vote against Citizens United. Uh, but I think the chances uh, are dimming every day. Uh, and so I strongly support a constitutional amendment uh, that would clarify that corporations are not people under the First Amendment. Uh, I am privileged to chair an organization called Common Cause, which for 40 years, uh, founded by John Gardner, uh, who is a cabinet member of a Republican administration, uh, for 40 years has tried to get money out of politics. Uh, I wish I could say that Common Cause has succeeded. But there are periods of time, uh, for example, right after the Watergate scandal, when the public became so outraged at what money had done to our political system that it put pressure on our politicians to pass campaign finance reform. McCain-Feingold and other very important campaign finance reforms. Uh, we can do it again. We can do it again. Even Citizens United does not rule out the possibility of public financing. And public financing of whatever sort, I mean, for example, uh, the federal government provides a dollar matching for every dollar from a small contributor. There are many ways of doing it, but public financing would go a long way to leveling the playing field and reducing the extraordinary power of money on our political system. I, I met with House Democrats last week at their annual retreat. Many of them I had worked with 20 years ago. And I asked them how things were going and we talked uh, small talk and a little bit of middle talk. But then uh, the topic turned to money and how much time they are spending raising money for their next elections. And it is absolutely staggering. I've never heard anything like this. We're drowning our political system and our democracy in money, and the money is not coming from small contributors. It is coming from big contributors, and bigger and bigger contributors. One final point, Alan Simpson, a senator from Wyoming, Republican, with whom I see eye to eye on nothing, literally or figuratively, he's very tall, but he is, a, he is a dear friend, and we were talking recently, and he is getting more and more upset about all of the money in politics, and he said to me, uh, he thinks 
If it continues to go in this direction, it's going to be possible for a handful of billionaires to purchase the next president. And I think he's right. And we cannot tolerate that. So if you could implement one program, what would it be? Well, given Citizens United, I do think that public financing, because it is still legal, still legal under the First Amendment, I think public financing of general elections, particularly presidential elections, senatorial elections, gubernatorial elections, uh, a form of public financing is critically important. Uh, at the very least, we need full disclosure, full disclosure of everyone who is financing any major election. Right now, we've had a number of disclosure bills fail on Capitol Hill. We don't even know who financed much of the last presidential election. We don't know what corporations financed much of the last presidential election. At the very least, full public disclosure. Lots of questions. Uh, you, you mentioned the minimum wage, but uh, lots of questions because of last night. Has the rising federal minimum wage had a positive effect on unemployment, or has it been damaging? Uh, uh, another one. Well, uh, do, you a... believe, do you believe that President Obama's State of the Union plan to raise the minimum wage will succeed? What impact will an increase in the minimum wage have in an economy that is still struggling to find its footing? That's too many questions for me to keep in my head at once. But they're all about the minimum wage. I, say what you want to say about the minimum uh, I, wage. I, look, there, there's a very lively uh, and important debate among economists as to whether uh, a relatively small percent increase in the minimum wage uh, will have a negative employment effect because it will deter employers from hiring or whether it will have a positive employment effect because so many more people will have more money in their pockets to turn around and buy stuff. Uh, when you're talking about moving from $7.25 to $9 an hour, uh, mo I've convinced, I, I am absolutely convinced that uh, the positive employment effects outweigh the negative employment effects for, the, uh, so for a very simple set of reasons. Uh, most of these employees are not working for firms that are in international competition or where technology is likely to displace them. They're working for uh, retail or restaurant or uh, hotel uh, workers. These are, I'm sorry? And they are small, they're all small businesses, those, thank you for your outburst, I appreciate that. <laughs> no, no, they are, they're all, they're all small businesses, but the level, the playing field, uh, if, if the playing field is leveled for all of those uh, small businesses in retail, restaurant, and hotel, uh, and, uh, uh, and other similar uh, businesses sheltered from international competition and also sheltered uh, from technology, uh, I'm convinced it will not have a negative employment effect. That is, the costs will be passed on and can be passed on to consumers very easily. Most studies that I have seen show that. And in fact, Alan Kruger, uh, who is now the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors for the President, uh, did a study years ago uh, that came to that conclusion, and I, I think it was a very good study. Several questions on climate change. Um, we've made a lot of strides in, uh, in energy efficiency. I think the President outlined some of those last night. Uh, we've done this uh, substitution of, or doing the substitution of natural gas for coal, uh, and our CO2 emissions have gone down somewhat. Uh, raising, it seems like the only way to reduce CO2 is to raise the cost of energy. How can we do that, and uh, what, what would you do for cli on climate change? Because in a struggling economy, raising the price of energy is probably uh, a tough so. Uh, it is very hard uh, to do that. Uh, many of you remember that in the 2008 election, uh, John McCain uh, and uh, President Obama, then uh, uh, Barack Obama, Senator Obama, uh, both came up with plans for cap and trade. That is, capping the amount of pollution that can be emitted and using tradable permits under that cap uh, to gradually reduce the amount of pollution. That is, as that cap tightened over time, uh, those tradable permits would be more and more costly and thereby create incentives for companies to innovate uh, toward greater and greater uh, pollution control. Both John McCain and Senator Barack Obama were in favor. What happened in the intervening years? We had a great recession. 
so I think that you are absolutely correct, uh, questioner. Uh, it is very difficult to either have a cap and trade system or even a system of carbon taxes uh, when the economy is already uh, anemic and many consumers are already uh, worried. Uh, even if you did what I think we need to do, and that is a carbon tax, the proceeds of which are remitted to every single American on a pro rata basis, uh, that still uh, might have a chilling effect simply because it will increase the prices of a lot of goods uh, on a lot of consumers. Uh, so we may, and I say this with a great deal of regret, uh, we may have to wait until the economy is a little bit stronger. A lot of questions on education, but here's one. As a student, public education is really important to me. What can be done in California to save public education? Uh, well, I, as someone who has the great privilege uh, of teaching at the best public university in the world, Had you not applauded, I would have been <laughs> suspicious that you were all Stanford graduates. <laughs> uh, I have a, a particular interest in this. I mean, California stands to me as exhibit number one in terms of how a sophisticated, enlightened state can destroy its educational system. Uh, not wittingly, not as if anybody said we want to destroy it, but uh, you remember, many people in this room must remember, I was not here, I was off in another state, colder and bitterer, <laughs> unhappy place. <laughs> but you here in California, you, some of you remember that, you know, not that many years ago, 40 years ago, California had the best K through 12 system and the best system of higher public education in the country. Now, California's K through 12 system is 49th out of 50th in this country. 49th out of 50th. Thank goodness for Mississippi. <laughs> and we still have a, a, a fabulous system of public higher education, but it is endangered. Now, I am the first to admit that money is not everything. You've got to have good teaching and a good system and uh, ways of imparting knowledge that work. But at the very least, you've got to have enough money. And if we're starving our schools and starving our public universities, we can't expect great outcomes. I don't have any easy solutions, Peter. I mean, the state's budget is turning around. The governor has committed himself to doing more, but we are not nearly out of the woods. I'm sorry? Okay. He said Proposition 13. I think that's an issue around here. Um, you mentioned uh, having money and spending. This is a question. It says, is there or can there ever be an alternative to consumer spending as a goal of life on this planet? If not, what is hope for our children and their children? It's all about stuff. Well, I, I think we've got to get away from consumer spending. I, by the way, this, this has a bearing upon my initial comments to you. Please understand there's a distinction between consumerism, which is just buying stuff, just filling your house with things, and adequate consumption as an economic matter, adequate demand. That is, uh, we could have consumption of art, of music, of health care, uh, of parks, of recreation, of, of good, uh, good child care. I, I mean, there are all kinds of ways that aggregate demand can express itself. We can, we can have consumption of a better environment. We can have a consumption of, of cleaner rivers and parks and everything else. Uh, so when we're talking about aggregate demand and consumption, don't confuse it with simply consumers going out and buying gadgets and stuff to fill their houses up with. That is not what, in economic terms, we're talking about with regard to adequate ad economic demand. Uh, why is it that wealthy nations have a better environment 
than poor nations because wealthy nations can afford it. Economic growth is not bad in and of itself. The question is, what do you use that growth for? Do you use the growth for a better environment, healthier people, better education, or do you use that growth simply for the creation and consumption of a lot of items that are just going to end up polluting the environment and utilize gigantic amounts of energy? So I know you said a lot about debt in your, in your comments, but there are several questions on the debt level. Uh, it says, last night Obama laid out some great new initiatives, all of which he said would have no effect on our deficit. What effect do you, what effect do you predict the current debt will have on the next generation? You say that debt is important only in relationship to the GDP, but what do you say about the fact that $15 trillion deficit is almost 100% of GDP? Well, all I can tell you is that when I, when I was a small boy, and I remember this very, very distinctly, uh, my father, who was a staunch Republican and uh, hated FDR, my father said to me, well, he's come a long way now, but he's, he, he said to me, Bobby, uh, you and your children and your children's children will be paying down the debt created by Franklin D. Roosevelt. Now, I was, this was in the early 50s. I was six years old. I, I didn't know what a debt was, <laughs> but I was scared. <laughs> and I remember I had, I did, I quite seriously, I had nightmares about the debt. I didn't know, you know, this thing called the debt. It was, it was this amorphous thing that would just, that was wreck my life and my children and my children's children's life. Well, interestingly, you know, my father uh, has not been wrong about many things, but he was absolutely wrong about this. Uh, what happened to the Franklin D. Roosevelt debt? In 1946, the debt was 120% of the entire national economy that year. Higher, much higher as a proportion of the economy than it is right now. What happened to that FDR debt? Why is it that the FDR debt is not still dogging me or my children or my grandchild? I have a four-year-old grandchild. Not once has she mentioned Franklin D. <laughs> Roosevelt and the debt he created. Well, was it because we, we stopped paying very much money? We, we stopped, the government stopped... Uh, well, no, because in the 50s, remember, we had a Korean War, we had a Cold War in the 60s, right through the 70s, the 80s. In the 1950s, we had a national highway building program. We rebuilt America. We rebuilt our educational system. We rebuilt Europe. We rebuilt Japan. It wasn't a matter of reducing government expenditures. What happened was the denominator of the equation, not the numerator, the denominator, growth. The size of the U.S. economy exploded. We grew more than 3% a year. The problem, the central problem, the essential problem, aside from health care expenditures and baby boomers and baby boomers' health care needs in the future, another big problem is slow economic growth. That's what we have to tackle as well. What would be the pros and cons of, in your book you've mentioned uh, ta putting a tax or putting a fee on stock market transactions. So the question here is what would be the pros and cons of implementing a modest tax on stock market transactions to increase revenues? Uh, I don't think there's much of, of a con. Uh, this was a small tax, a, a small one-tenth of one percent tax on all financial transactions, first recommended by James Tobin, who was in the Council of Economic Advisors for John F. Kennedy, uh, a, a professor of economics at Yale. Uh, and the idea of a Tobin tax has now been taken up by Europe. The Europeans are marching forward, moving on a tr financial transactions tax, and it will generate considerable revenue. Why can't we do the same? The fact that the Europeans are doing it takes away the argument that Wall Street has been using for years, which is it will put us at a financial disadvantage relative to other financial capitals, particularly the European. So now is a good time. And while we're at it, let's put a limit on the size of the big banks to make sure that they, no bank is ever again too big to fail. And while we're at it, let's bring back the Glass-Steagall Act separating investment banking from commercial banking. 
and, and by the way, I am very sad to report to you, if you don't know it already, that that Glass-Steagall Act disappeared, was rescinded in effect during the Clinton administration, the last year of the Clinton administration. I was long gone. <laughs> so I'm not directly responsible, but that was a mistake. This question, uh, what viable alternatives exist to globalization for developing countries? How, if at all, can developing countries build their economies without it? Uh, I don't think we should reject globalization at all. The question is, are there ways of globalizing that don't harm developing nations, but at the same time don't harm us? It's not a zero-sum game in which they gain to the extent that we don't, or we gain to the extent that they don't gain. The global economy, properly organized, is a positive-sum game. We grow together. That's what happened in the first three decades after the Second World War. We can do it again. Now, how can we do it specifically? For example, suppose we had a rule that said to all of our trading partners, including us, that our minimum wage and your minimum wage has to be half your median wage. Well, what that would do is make sure that the gains from growth were widely distributed and widely spread, which would be good for them and good for us. Yesterday, the president announced a, a trading agreement, or at least not a, tra a negotiation for a trade agreement between the U.S. and the EU. Uh, what's the, what are the benefits of that, and uh, do you think it's going to happen? Uh, I think the benefits could be considerable because we're talking about two of the largest trading blocks, uh, or the tra two of the largest traders uh, in the world. Uh, and if we get tariffs and quotas down, there aren't that many between the United States and Europe, but if we get them down, uh, that will improve both regions and economies' efficiencies. So it's a good idea. The time has come. I don't see where we're going to get much opposition. Questions about uh, workforce skills. You know, uh, many people uh, say that there's, there's, uh, you know, that the unemployment is a problem of people not having skills to do the jobs that are available. Uh, is that a problem? And if so, what can we do about that? It is a problem. I mean, most of the unemployment issue right now is due to inadequate aggregate demand. But there is undoubtedly some percentage of the unemployment problem that's due to a mismatch between what people looking for work can do and what employers need. And people often ask me, in fact, I, when I was labor secretary, I would hear this all the time, what are the jobs of the future? What should people be training for? And the answer is not ever clear, because most of the jobs of the future have not been created. That's why they're jobs of the future. <laughs> but one thing we can know, and we can at least predict with some certitude, is that not every young person should have to go through one narrow gate called a four-year college degree in order to make it in America. There ought to be other ways of doing it. And we know that one of the greatest shortages we have across the country, expressed in a variety of ways and shows up in a variety of indices, is a shortage of technicians, people who understand a particular domain of technology enough to be able to not only install it, but improve it, monitor it, repair it, and continue to improve upon it. And this is true of office technology, and healthcare technology. It's true even, I, I remember my first time down at the bottom of a mine, a coal shaft. One of the things that I did as Secretary of Labor, I, I was in charge of the safety of coal miners, of all things. I never knew I would ever go into a coal shaft. Those coal shafts are five by five, five feet high, five feet wide. I was the only person who could march through a coal <laughs> shaft. And those coal shafts, at the end of a, of a, of a shaft of a, a mine, at the end of one of those mines, uh, I expected to find coal miners with, with pickets, you know, just you know, the, old, the old kind of uh, picks. But that's not what was there. What was there was some of the most advanced, complicated 
machinery I had ever seen. And you had miners who had had advanced training to monitor and repair on the spot and to maintain those complicated machines that were measuring not only the amount of coal, but also all of the particulates in the air around that shaft, the dangers and potential dangers. Everywhere you look in this economy, you've got technical skills in short supply. And if we had a system of technical education that was anywhere like the extraordinarily well-developed system of technical education Germany has, we could have another route for our young people that would generate good jobs, well-paying jobs. I think we're getting to the last question here, but uh, there's one quick one. How, how was your date with Hillary Clinton? That's a very personal question. <laughs> I, 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 I guess I have to confess to you that I had a date with someone named Hillary Rodham. I never dated Hillary Clinton. <laughs> That's an important distinction. Uh, when I was a uh, sophomore in college, uh, at Dartmouth College, she was a freshman uh, at Wellesley, and uh, we had a date. I, I, I actually, uh, this, is a, this is a true story, I didn't remember the date until uh, a reporter for the New York Times in 2008, when she was running for president, called me and said, uh, we found a whole set of her old letters from Wellesley, and uh, they include a reference to a date with you. Can you tell us about that date? And, uh, and also, can you, was there anything about that date that might shed light on how she would perform as president? <laughs> No, seriously. <laughs> and first of all, I didn't remember it. And then uh, he went on and I said, I I I'm sorry, excuse me. And he said, uh, uh, he s mentioned Antonioni's film, Blow Up. And suddenly the date came back. We had gone to a film. It was Antonioni's film, Blow Up. And then I still thought it was a silly question. So I said, well, uh, what I remember is that she wanted an extraordinary amount of butter on her popcorn. <laughs> And then there was silence. I thought he had hung up. I said, are you still there? He said, I'm just writing this down. <laughs> and then two days later, there was a little column in the New York Times mentioning my date and mentioning how much popcorn, how much butter she wanted on our popcorn. Standards of American journalism. Professor Reich, we have over 50 questions here. I just want to uh, hope everybody will join me in thanking you for a fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs>